morning and happy Sabbath. Naturally, um, whoa. I was reading about that song, Hallelujah. David had a special chord, and he can still praise the Lord. Hallelujah means praising God, right? But when he sinned, he was unable to praise God. He was unable to say hallelujah. And it also refers to us too. When we're in sin, how can you praise God, right? We have to submit to our sins and ask God for forgiveness. Then we can say hallelujah. Amen? Well, happy Sabbath and welcome to Clemens Estee Fellowship. I know we have some friends that we haven't seen here, um, the Van Gordons and uh, the rest of the uh, Filipino group from different churches uh, who uh, came today. And you will hear them, um, they will be singing a closing song. And also for our folks from Kernersville, looking forward to Pastor Bohr um, and coming uh, event there. Today, our key text is found in Matthew 5, 5, as uh, Dale had read. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's Matthew 5, 5. We are continuing our study of the Beatitudes. The half of the diagram is empty, emptying self, and the other half is the filling process. Now, just a review, um, in the first Beatitude, Blessed are the Poor in Spirit, we learn that there has to be an emptying of our lives before we can have the filling. We must become poor in spirit before we can become rich in God's blessings. Humbling ourselves is the first step toward entering the kingdom. In the second beatitude, blessed are they that mourn. We learn that mourning over our sins drives us to God, and there we can find comfort that we truly need. And we are now we are now in the third um, beatitude, which is the last process of emptying self. Then the filling process can begin. In my own life, I have been following these attitudes to draw closer to the Lord and Savior. It's not easy. It takes mental alertness to accept these behaviors. But with the aid of the Holy Spirit, I have a chance. Amen? I challenge you to try these steps in some diagram. Uh, I'm challenging you to try these steps. In some diagram, it's actually a wheel. It's not like a progressive um, arrow that goes up. It's actually a wheel that you just keep, keep continuing on learning how to be poor in spirit, humbling ourselves, how, how to be mourning our sin, how to be meek. And the title of this sermon is about the meekness of Christ. You know, we want to learn from the, from the Creator, right? We want to learn from Him. Here's our best example. In the third beatitude, or our attitude, we will see how the meek, i.e. those who really humbly submit, submission to the will of God, will enjoy the blessings of God here and now. What is, what is Christ calling us to do here? What is meekness? What does it look like? I wonder what comes to your mind when you hear the word meekness. Is it a meek person, someone who is soft-spoken, or maybe a person who has a limp handshake, or perhaps a person who is easily pushed over and does not seem to have much of a spine? Meekness definition is the quality or state of being meek, a mild, moderate, humble, or submissive quality. What are these qualities, you may ask? We all have this. But to be consistent, that's another challenge, right? Throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. 
those who have felt their need of Christ, those who have mourned because of sin and have sat with Christ in the school of affliction, will learn meekness from the divine teacher. That's from the Mount Blessings 13.2. Our example or our teacher is who? Christ, right? The meekness of Christ. What do you think Jesus is referring to here? What is this meekness that I'm, I am to go after and guess, get as much of it into my life as I possibly can? I want us to do a reset of the meaning of the word meek today and to see that it is only possible through the Holy Spirit. The Bible compares our fallen human nature to the impulse of wild animals. God says to his own people, the Israelites, he says, they are like a wild donkey and a restless, on the King James Version, dromedary. I was like, what is a dromedary? On other, ver on other um, verses, it's a camel. Have you ever thought of that, a dromedary? Now, I learned something today. Not a flattering description of the Israelites, right? Um, Matthew Henry, a um, uh, commentary, commentator, draws this conclusion. Man's corrupt nature has made him like a wild donkey. But the grace of meekness, when he gets dominion in the soul, alters the temper of it brings it to hand and submits it to management. Let's open your Bible to so Psalm 149.4. If you have it, say amen. It says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people, he will beautify the meek, or the humble, with salvation. Isn't that a beautiful um, passage in Psalm 149? For, for the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek. In my life today, page 253, it says, The most precious fruit of sanctification is the grace of meekness. When this grace presides in the soul, the disposition is molded by its influence. There is a continual waiting upon God and a submission of the will to His. The understanding grasps every divine truth and the will bows to every divine precept without doubting or murmuring. It says, true meekness softens and subdues the heart and gives the mind a fitness for in the engrafted word. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like that in your mind? It places us with Mary as, as a learner at the feet of Jesus. It places, at, places us on Lydia's story when uh, Paul was preaching. It's the submission to God, right? It says, the meek will he guide in judgment, <clears throat> and the meek will he teach his way. Like the child Samuel, they pray, speak, Lord, for what? My servant heareth. When Joshua was placed in the highest position of honor, as commander of Israel, he bade defiance to all the enemies of God. His heart was filled with noble thoughts of his great mission. Yet upon the intimation of a message from heaven, he placed himself in the position of a little child to be directed. He said, what saith my Lord unto his servant? was his response. <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you guys been dry lately? I just can't get enough water. I don't know why. Meekness is the means by which God tames the sinful soul, by taming the temper, subduing assertive self, calming the passions, managing the impulses of the heart, and bringing order out of chaos in the soul. Think about a horse that has not yet been broken. Has anybody had a horse here? Or has ridden, uh, yeah, Karen, right, right. 
Well, when I was in the Philippines, um, we used to climb on this tree. It's called lumboy. Remember lumboy? It's a black fruit. And in order for you to get this tree, uh, this, this fruit, you have to climb up the tree and then just pick it and then, you know, blow on it and then eat it. And that's a big seed. But one day, as I was, my, my plan was to go to that lumboy tree. And guess what I saw? A white spotted horse tied to the tree. I was like, oh, you know, it's probably tamed, right? So I went there and... Um, I was like, hey, horsey, you know, I, you always want to go in the front, and, you know, she, he just went like this. And I started, you know, just putting my hand on, on his neck. And then when I started going to the back, I guess he didn't like that. And guess what he did to me? No, he turned, he turned his face and then just went like this to me on my back and graced me with his teeth. And I was so scared I didn't have my lumboy that day. I was like, man, that is a wild horse. <clears throat> Think about a horse that has not yet been broken. It bucks and it kicks. And when someone goes near to it, it resists the bit and the bridle. It's not used to the hand. But when it gets used to the hand, the horse has dignity and poise. The animal is at peace. And it is altogether different. By nature, we're all like the unbroken horse. We resist God's hand. We kick against him. As long as we are fighting God, we cannot experience peace within ourselves. When we are at war in ourselves, sometimes the turmoil will spill over onto other peoples, into our family, into our workplace, even here at church. C.H. Spurgeon describes five words of meekness. Just meekness is humble. Meekness is gentle. Meekness is patient, forgiving, and contented. Jesus is calling us to something very wonderful here as we live our lives. Grow in meekness, and you will gain control over anger. Meekness will moderate your passions, it will subdue your impulsiveness. Number two, meekness will change the way you speak. It will give you control over the harsh word and the sharp put down. Have you tried that? Man, when I was preparing this, like, okay, let me try that, okay? Before I speak, I'm going to think, right? I'm going to think before I speak. And it has to be, you know, the character of Christ. What should I speak? How should I, how should I speak? Grow in meekness and you will discover contentment. Sometimes, you know, we just want to be contented, right? I say, okay, I, don't want to, I just want to be contented. I just want to be at peace. You will be, you will be reconciled to the position you are in, in. Meekness will help you to accept the difficulties that you face, even to see the hand of God in them. Have you seen the hand of God in your lives? Grow in meekness, and you will enjoy peace. Meekness is being used to the hand. Another way to say this is, meekness is about submission. Submission means you put your mission under the mission of someone else, right? So we put our mission above who? Or under who? Under Christ, Christ's mission. How do we submit? First, submit to God's word. This is God's word. Receive meekness with the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, James 1.21. The evidence that a person really submits to God is that they do not believe what Jesus says. In Matthew 7.24, if you have your Bibles open there, it says, whoever hears my words and put them into what? Practice. It's like a man who builds his house on a rock. A church where the Bible is taught clearly and valued highly is a wonderful place because our lives are nourished by the Word. This is how Christians grow. This is how we become meek. Number two, submitting to God's will. 
There are times in the life of every believer when God puts you in a place you would not choose to be. It may come through difficult circumstances at work, in the family, difficulties in church or in regards to your health. When God brings you to a place you would not choose, unbelief rises up from the flesh that always resists God. This must mean that God does not love me. Resentment grows and envy settles in. Why does he or she have that blessing and it was not given to me? You may ask. What does meekness look like when God puts you in a place that you have not chosen for yourself? Well, as I said, let's look at the example, right? Come with me to a garden. It's late and it's dark. A few men are asleep in the garden. Further on, there is another man. His whole body is draped over a stone. You walk closer and you see that he is sweating profusely. He is in agony of soul. Then he says, it's in Matthew 26, 39, Father, if it is possible, let this cup be taken from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Frame that picture, that meekness, Jesus submitting himself to the will of the Father at an imaginable cost. And this is what Jesus is calling us to do. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Number three, submit, submitting to God's people. This one, I was like, what? Submitting to God's people, right? But the Bible clearly says it, right? Ephesians 5.21. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Paul is describing what it looks like when God's people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They sing to each other in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, a plug-in for our um, Wednesday evening prayer meeting. If you can make it, please come. You will be blessed. Every time I come, I'm blessed. I've learned something. There are always, they're always giving thanks. There's one more evidence of people being filled with the Holy Spirit. They submit to one another. Meekness grows through the discipline of committed relationships in the body of Christ. God's gift to the believer, the normal pattern of healthy Christians relationship is that we submit to one another in the body of what? Christ. Meekness is formed out of the difficulty of doing this. In Philippians 2, 3, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in what? In humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Is that hard to do? What well, below submitting to God's people is when you are opposed... Some examples of meekness in action and see how difficult it can be even among God's people that we can learn from. Submitting to God's people when you are opposed. Moses was very meek, right? More than all people who were in the face of the earth. That's Numbers 12.3. Why does the Bible say this? Think about what he had to endure. God calls Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt who had been slaves for 400 years. What must that pressure have been like leading God's people? Can you imagine? By God's grace, Moses led them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. He brought them to Sinai where God made a covenant with them. You'd think God's people would be grateful to Moses. What if you were there? Would you be grateful for Moses? Or would you say, I miss Egypt? By nature, 
my flesh would have said, you've never seen such blessings. And all I hear is you moaning and complaining about what you don't like. But Moses was not like that. So here's what he did. He prayed for those who said the most ungrateful things about him. He even said to God that he would rather his own name be what? Blotted out of God's book in order that they not be blotted out. Wow. Can you say that? That's meekness. How about when you are provoked? The story goes back to 2 Samuel 16, 5 through 7. Shimi, is it Shimi or Shimai? Shimi? Threw stones at David, right? And Shimi said, as he cursed, Come out, come out, you man of blood, you man of bilio. What a wretch man Shimi has, must have been. Maybe as you hear this story, you will think of someone who has given you some grief. Shimi belonged to the house of Saul. He was Saul's man, and he had nothing good to say about David, even though Saul was long since dead, and David had been anointed as king over Israel. David was Israel's greatest king, but Shimei didn't have a good word to say about him. Abishai, David's um, guard, who was one of David's loyal men, didn't think the king should have to put up with this. He said, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But David showed meekness towards Shimei. He said, leave him alone. He said, and let him curse. And that's what Shimei proceeded to do. I want you to get this picture. So David and his men went on the road while Shimei was what? And along on the hillside opposite of him, was cursing and throwing stones and throwing dust. And the king and all the people with him arrived weary at the Jordan. Can you believe that? That's one of Saul's men, and he, he didn't want to accept that David is king. Shimei showed extreme and justifiable provocation towards the king of Israel. And David put up with it. It would have been so easy for David to get rid of Shimei, right? He could have just said, hey, take him out. But he puts up with him. Amazing. That's meekness. How about when you're disappointed? In Paul's trials, sometimes we're disappointed because our expectations are unreasonably high. But surely, after all the ministry Paul had poured into the lives of so many believers, it was reasonable for him to expect this. When he was placed on trial in a court of law, someone could have come and stand with him. Did anybody stand with him? No. Nobody did. He says, at my first defense, no one came by me, but all deserted me. How would you feel if that happened to you? Listen to the meekness in this. He said in 2 Timothy 4.16, it says, May it not be charged against them. He praised, he praised the blessing of people who let him down. Now that's meekness. Let me just ask you a question. If one of our members here is in trial and standing for the Lord, are we willing to stand by that person? Yes? Yes. Let's stand by him. You know? Just by seeing that Paul had done so many things and nobody stood by him in his trial. How about when you are persecuted? When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That's 1 Peter 2.23. Christ could have said with absolute justice, you wait, but his justice is tempered with great mercy. Amen? And instead he says what? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. It's Luke 23.34. That's the meekness of Christ. How did he do that? 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live in righteousness. By his wounds, we are what? We are healed. 1 Peter 2, 23 and 24. Meekness is seen in bearing wounds, forgiving injuries, and returning good for evil. It says, take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is what? Is light. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Are you fully submitted to his word and to his rod? Inherit the earth means that the meek shall be received into his kingdom and partake the blessings. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like to be inheritors of the earth? It is my prayer that we will soon see Jesus face to face. Amen? We will emulate how to be meek like the meekness of Christ. He is the ultimate example for us. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. How many of us will take a stand today to fully submit our lives to this mission? Please raise your hands. Amen. Meekness, I like this one. Meekness is not weakness. It is strength under control. His mission above our mission. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I will read you a poem by John G. Whittier and Frederick C. Maker. It's, a, it's actually a, a poem and a hymn. This is also a prayer. So if you could just close your eyes as I read. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind. In purer lives, thy service find. In deeper reverence, praise. O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving ceased. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Breathe through the heat of our desire thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire. O oh, still, small voice of calm. In simple trust like theirs who heard, beside the Syrian sea, the gracious calling of the Lord, let us, like them, without a word, rise up and follow thee. Amen.